What you're looking at is a signal scientists have been searching for for over 20 years. It's a direct message from the nucleus of the isotope thorium-229. And in a breakthrough, they've finally found it. Why have they been searching for this? And what does it mean now that they've found it? This could help unlock the fundamental laws of the universe. You might not know this, but it's long been suspected that the fundamental constants of our universe, those foundational numbers we assume never change, are actually changing by tiny amounts. If they shift, even slightly, it could transform our understanding of physics, giving us clues about dark matter, extra dimensions from string theory, or even a fifth force. Scientists have been trying to measure changes in the fundamental constants for decades, but our measuring equipment hasn't been sensitive enough. But now this signal is the key to creating the world's first nuclear clock, a device precise enough to detect changes that have previously been impossible to measure. Once it's complete, this clock could open a gateway to new physics, challenging long-standing theories about our universe. In this video, we'll discuss this discovery and its implications for science, but before we dive in, let's quickly recap. What are fundamental constants and why do they matter so much? Fundamental constants are fixed numbers that exist in the universe. They set the stage for how the laws of physics work. Some examples are the speed of light, which places a limit on how fast we can travel or send information. Boltzmann's constant, which governs the relationship between temperature and energy and the gravitational constant, which dictates how strongly two masses attract each other through gravity. Physicists have boiled down the fundamental constants that shape our universe to just 26 numbers. Our current theory of known matter, the standard model, treats these numbers as unchanging in both space and time. The funny thing about fundamental constants is that they can't be predicted from theory. That's what makes them, well, fundamental. They have to be experimentally measured. Nature kind of just has to tell us what they are, and no one knows why they have the values that they do. As far as we know, these numbers are just written into the fabric of the universe. Even though they're a bit of a mystery, the constants aren't causing any trouble. Or so we thought. Theories are starting to arise that are making scientists question the constantness of the constants. Theories link to some of physics' deepest unsolved problems. For example, they couldn't help but notice that many of the constants have the exact perfect values to support life. If some of them were off by even the tiniest amount, life as we know it probably wouldn't exist. Take this one, the fine structure constant. It's not as famous as some of its constant cousins like the speed of light, but it's a favorite among scientists. Richard Feynman once said, all good theoretical physicists put this number up on their wall and worry about it. It combines the electron's charge, the vacuum permittivity, Planck's constant, and the speed of light, and has the value of about 1 over 137. Just like the gravitational constant tells us the strength of gravity, the fine structure constant tells us the strength of electromagnetism. It's a pretty big deal because electromagnetism affects, well, electricity and magnetism, which is also light, friction, and basically all of chemistry. Now what's crazy is that its value lies in a perfect sweet spot. It's strong enough to bind electrons to the atom's nucleus, but loose enough to let them whiz around and interact with other atoms, performing chemical reactions, which are kind of the basis of life. If alpha were just a tiny bit weaker, electrons wouldn't bind to the nucleus at all. But if alpha were just a tiny bit stronger, electrons couldn't move freely and no chemistry would happen. It seems to lie in this perfect Goldilocks zone for life to exist. How did that happen? Why is our universe so perfect for life to exist? Well, a theory that's been proposed to explain this puzzle is if the constants vary in space and time, and life appeared in a part of the universe where the constants were the exact right values to support life. That would explain the extremely improbable chances of us being alive to measure them. Another reason some scientists think the constants might vary is because of newer theories of physics, like string theory, which tries to unify gravity and quantum mechanics one of the biggest unresolved challenges in physics. 
These theories involve extra spatial dimensions to our current theories, and we would perceive changes to these spatial dimensions as the fundamental constants changing. And the final theory that the constants might be changing comes from the study of dark matter. Dark matter is the mysterious matter that accounts for over 20% of the universe's mass, yet we know almost nothing about it. Some physicists think that dark matter interacts very weakly with an atom's electrons or nucleus, causing alpha to drift or oscillate by some extremely tiny amount. If we observe this drift, it could help us understand dark matter. What's amazing is that we actually already have some indication for variations in alpha. In galaxies far, far away, there are super bright objects called quasars. These are supermassive black holes that suck in gas like a whirlpool. As the gas gets sucked in, it heats up due to friction, and this makes it shine super bright. In fact, quasars are some of the brightest objects in the universe. To measure variations in alpha, we can look at the light coming from distant quasars. Quasars so far away that their light took several billion years to reach us. How? Well, as their light heads toward Earth, it runs into gas clouds along the way, which absorb some of the frequencies. The light frequencies that get absorbed depend on alpha. So if alpha were different in the past, we can detect a change in it by comparing the absorbed frequencies from the past to current frequencies. So what did scientists find? Well, different research groups came to different conclusions. A famous experiment by the John Webb team did observe small variations in alpha. But other research teams who performed similar experiments observed no variation at all. So the evidence is inconclusive. We need more precise measuring devices and perhaps even an entirely new method. That's where this discovery comes in. It's the first step in building something scientists have been trying to build for over 20 years, a nuclear clock a super accurate measuring device and our best bet for measuring variations in the constants. Cool, so let's get into what a nuclear clock is and how the scientists made this discovery. I know some of you have been thinking, nuclear clocks, don't we already have those? And the answer is no, we have atomic clocks. They're different and I'll explain what the difference is. Understanding nuclear clocks will be easier if we first understand atomic clocks anyway, so it works out. But before we get into that, I found out about this nuclear clock breakthrough because I like to keep up with the latest science news. And a news website and app I've been using for a while is today's sponsor, Ground News. What makes Ground News different is that it's designed to help you pull back the curtain on media bias. For example, recently a private lunar lander attempted a historic touchdown near the moon's south pole. It was an ambitious mission, but things didn't go exactly as planned. It landed sideways in a crater and was declared dead before completing its full mission. Some outlets framed it as a total failure, while others highlighted the valuable data it managed to collect before shutting down. It's interesting how the same event can be reported in such different ways, depending on who's telling the story. That's why I use Ground News. I want an unbiased picture that focuses on the facts. Ground News is a website and app designed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a visual breakdown of the sources, political bias, reliability, and ownership, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. Ground News makes it really easy to compare headlines and see how these biases might affect the framing. They even have a bias comparison feature that highlights specific differences in reporting. One of my favorite features is their blind spot feed, which shows you stories underreported by either side of the political spectrum. For example, if you lean right, you probably miss this story about the US Energy Secretary emphasizing the need for reliable energy to support the growth of artificial intelligence. As a fellow critical thinker, you know that we can't just rely on one piece of data or a single perspective to get the full picture. Ground News allows you to analyze news in a scientific way by comparing sources, checking for bias, and building a well-rounded understanding of the most important things going on in the world today. Ground News are offering you 40% of their Vantage subscription, which is the subscription I'm on. You get unlimited access to all of their amazing features. 
Access this discount through the link ground.news slash upandatom, which you can also find in the description of this video, or scan the QR code on screen. Support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent. Okay, back to the video. To understand what a nuclear clock is, we first need to understand what an atomic clock is. Today, keeping time is our most precisely measured physical quantity, more than even length or mass, and atomic clocks are our best timekeepers. Their precision made scientists think they're our best bet for detecting changes in fundamental constants like alpha. But how, you ask? The fine structure constant has nothing to do with time, and neither do a bunch of the other constants. Well, to understand, we need to understand what an atomic clock is and how it works. A key ingredient of any clock is a regularly repeating event, like the rotation of the Earth, a swing of a pendulum, or the oscillation of a quartz crystal in a watch. This repeating event serves as a reliable tick. But the annoying thing about these clocks is that they can be affected by the environment. Temperature, pressure, and humidity can affect their ticking rate. Their components can break down over time. Even their size and shape can affect how they tick. These problems make these clocks unreliable timekeepers. But atoms have a very reliable way of ticking. From quantum mechanics, we know that the electrons in an atom are restricted to specific energy levels. You can think of them like rungs on a ladder, a wonky, uneven ladder. An electron can jump between any two levels, but can't land in between them. The electrons jump by absorbing or emitting light at very specific frequencies. The energies of these light frequencies correspond to the size of the gaps between energy levels. And the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. For example, blue light has a higher frequency than red light, so blue light has higher energy. Atomic energy levels are extremely stable since they're set by the literal laws of nature. They don't change according to pressure or temperature or where they are in the universe. And because the energy levels are so stable, so are the transition frequencies. We can count out a specific number of oscillations of a particular frequency and use those counts as a reliable tick of a clock. For example, the basic unit of time, the second, is defined as the amount of time that passes after 9,192,631,770 oscillations of a certain transition light frequency from a cesium-133 atom. Because of an atomic clock stability and the fact that identical atoms under identical conditions are essentially the same, using an atomic clock is more fundamental than a pendulum or a quartz crystal. To put an atomic clock's accuracy into perspective, a cheap quartz wristwatch might drift about 15 seconds in a month. But the most accurate atomic clock in the world, a strontium-87 clock, drifts by only one second in nearly 40 billion years. That's almost three times the age of the universe. Now here's the cool part. Just as absorption frequencies from quasar light depend on alpha, so do an atom's energy levels. Remember how alpha is the strength of electromagnetism? It therefore influences how close the negatively charged electrons hang around the positively charged nucleus. So if alpha changes with space or time, the electron energy levels in an atom will change too, which will change the transition frequencies. By measuring changes in these transition frequencies, we can measure changes in alpha. Scientists have actually already tried to do this, and once again, there were problems. An experiment performed in 2018 did observe a fractional change in alpha of about one part in 100 quadrillion per year. This result means that if the value of alpha is changing, it's doing so extremely slowly. It would take 100 quadrillion years for its value to double. Okay, but even though they observed alpha's not changing much, it's still changing, right? Well, not exactly. Every measurement has some uncertainty called the error range, which tells us how much the true value might differ from the measured value. When we're measuring everyday objects, small error ranges usually don't matter that much. Who cares if a measurement is off by a quadrillionth of a meter? But when the objects are very, very small, error ranges can become significant. 
In this case, the error range includes zero, which means it's possible that there's no change in alpha at all. Once again, the evidence neither confirms nor denies a changing value of alpha. About 20 years ago, physicists started thinking about how to use a different part of the atom to make a clock, the nucleus. Just like an atom's electrons have energy levels, the atom's nucleus has energy levels too. But they're a bit different from the electron's energy levels. Inside the nucleus, there are two major forces at play. The strong nuclear force, which holds the protons and neutrons together tightly, and the electromagnetic force, which threatens to blow the nucleus apart because the positively charged protons repel each other. The balance of these two forces set up energy levels. But wait, why would a nuclear clock be more precise than an atomic clock? Well, even though atomic clocks are vastly better than regular clocks, they still have some problems. They're sensitive to unwanted stray electric and magnetic fields, which shift the clock's energy levels. And although they're much, much less affected by temperature than regular clocks, they're not completely immune. The nucleus, on the other hand, is sealed within the atom, shielded from the outside world by the electron cloud. So it's much less sensitive to unwanted electric and magnetic fields and temperature. Scientists estimate that nuclear clocks could be 10,000 times more sensitive to changes in alpha than atomic clocks. But there's been one major hurdle. Nuclear energy transitions are really, really big. This is because the strong force holds the protons and neutrons together so tightly. Nuclear transitions are usually about 1 million times greater than the transitions of an atom's electrons. They're so large that no modern laser can reach the energies needed to excite them. The technology simply hasn't been invented. Bridging these nuclear energy transitions requires gamma rays, the highest energy light, where no modern laser can go. But in the 1970s, scientists made a strange discovery. By a lucky coincidence, the electromagnetic and strong nuclear forces in the thorium-229 nucleus are balanced so that one of its transitions is way smaller than all other nuclear energy gaps, about 10,000 times smaller. This energy lies in the ultraviolet range, placing it within the reach of modern lasers. In 2003, when scientists first started to think about how to build a nuclear clock, thorium-229 was the perfect candidate. Wait, did I just say 2003? If they found out about thorium in the 70s and they've been trying to build a nuclear clock since the early 2000s, and we're in 2025, that's over 20 years. If it's so important, why haven't they built it yet? Well, it turns out exciting a nucleus is really hard. There are a handful of engineering challenges that had to be overcome, spanning across nuclear physics, laser physics, quantum optics, and material science. The main problem was just knowing where to look. People knew the transition was small, but they needed to pinpoint the exact size before they could even begin building a clock. Guessing and adjusting a laser's frequency to match a transition whose size you don't know is like shooting in the dark. It'll take ages. But in 2023, CERN pinpointed the transition's energy. It was about eight electron volts, which corresponds to a wavelength of about 148 nanometers. This discovery set into motion a flurry of three major experiments, all in 2024. In April, a team from Germany and Austria were the first to excite the transition with a laser. In July, scientists at UCLA confirmed the result, improving the CERN frequency precision by a factor of 1,000. And in September, a third experiment made a breakthrough when they measured the transition using a special custom-built ultraviolet laser. The frequency comb laser allowed them to be 1 million times more precise than the previous two experiments. And that's what this is the long sought after transition frequency from the thorium nucleus. It's a frequency of 2 trillion, 20 billion, 407 million, 385 kilohertz, plus or minus two kilohertz. This is an exciting first step towards building the world's first nuclear clock and potentially rewriting the laws of physics. A huge thank you to my patrons on Patreon who make these videos possible. 
If you'd like to consider supporting the channel, the link to my Patreon is on screen and in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.